Washington City Council meeting of the 5th of June, 2017. Please rise for a pledge of allegiance to the flag, followed by a period of silent meditation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. In accordance with LB 898, a copy of the Open Meetings Act is posted at the back of the chamber. The order of, the business, order of business of the Lincoln City Council is as follows. The clerk will call the items listed on the agenda under public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak on an item should come forward after the clerk reads that item. The applicant and those in favor should speak first, then those opposed. The applicant may then make one short rebuttal. Each speaker should begin by stating name address and whether you are speaking in favor or in opposition to the item. Testimony is limited to five minutes per speaker. After all public hearings, the council will vote on resolutions and items listed under third reading. On the second and last meetings of the month, immediately prior to adjournment, anyone may speak on an issue not on the agenda for that date, nor plan it for, for a future date. And I believe this is not a public open mic night. So will the clerk please call the first item of business? Yes, our first item of business is our public hearing consent agenda, items one through 13. All right, we have someone here who is uh, being appointed. Uh, so Mr. Middleton, will you come forward please? Good afternoon, council members. My name is Bryce Middleton, 6725 Leesburg Court. Uh, I'm here today to uh, petition to be part of the, the Veterans Memorial Garden Council. Um, I'm a friend of a member who's currently on that council and uh, knows of my background and approached me about my interest on it. Uh, I've gone to a couple of meetings, uh, most recently at the Candlelight Vigil, uh, and, and just am very excited about a lot of the projects they have ongoing. I know uh, talking to them and some of the members of their current board that uh, they, they have a lot of uh, great plans for that uh, place out there, and, and there's a lot of things that have been ongoing as well. And so just uh, my background is I'm retired Air Force, uh, so I have a vested interest uh, in the Veterans Memorial Garden, and I'd just uh, like to be part of some of the things they have planned to adequately recognize the service and uh, sacrifice that our service members make. Okay, are there questions for Bryce? Cindy? Thank you. Sorry. Thanks for being here to, today. Thank you for your willingness to serve. I love the projects that they have going out there. And um, I just admire anyone that's willing to serve and really pay the proper respect to our military. So thank you for that. Thank you, ma'am. Larry? Well, I was just going to comment that I love this process because you find out things about people you didn't know. And my goodness, what a heck of a resume. And uh, didn't know about your Air Force background, but you're being quite modest because I see that you are a um, you know, you worked at the Pentagon uh, as a deputy division chief. You've been a policy analyst in the White House. Um, you've had significant roles on many different Air Force bases. And I mean, it's really, it seems like uh, just a tremendous career of service that, that we get to know about now through your interest in our, in our commission. So thank you for stepping forward. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Would anybody else like to testify on this item or any of the items on our consent agenda? Very well, Teresa. All right, if not, we can vote on these items. Items one through three were introduced by Eskridge. So moved. Second. Moved by Carl, seconded by Jane. Discussion? Please call the roll. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Rebold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Then items 4 and 9 through 11 were introduced by Gaylor Baird. So moved. Second. Moved by Larry and second by Jane. Discussion. Please call the roll. Gaylor Baird. Yes. Lamb. Yes. Raybold. Yes. Shobe. Yes. Camp. Yes. Christensen. Yes. Eskridge. Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Next then are public hearing liquor resolutions. We would request those giving testimony to please clearly state their name and address and sign in on the podium. Those giving testimony are asked to come forward, raise their right hand for the clerk to administer the oath. After the oath, witnesses shall state their names and addresses. 
I'll call items 14 and 15 together. They're the application of Delioso Pizzeria for a Class C liquor license at 3001 Northwest 12th Street, as well as the manager application of Mr. Patel. Do you raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth as you verily believe it to be? Yes, I do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just state Patel, your name and address. My name is Dushant Patel, 3001 Northwest 12th Street, Lincoln, Nebraska. We're basically a pizzeria there, and we want to introduce some beer and a few other things, so we applied for the uh, liquor license for that. Excellent. Questions? Carl. Yes. Uh, thanks, for Mr. Patel, for being here. And So you also own the hotel, hotel. as well as, as the restaurant? That's correct, sir. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we had an issue uh, in a recent hearing that, that there was a challenge with that, and, and I think it would be helpful if, if we could have uh, Conan Schaefer come forward and maybe explain to us some differences over this situation from, from what we previously considered. Okay. Investigator Schaefer? Investigator Conan Schaefer, Lincoln Police Department. Thank you, Conan. Um, so in, in the previous situation, which we uh, were considering, there, the ownership was separate. The, the restaurant, the Correct. bar in that case, uh, versus the, the hotel. Correct. Uh, you want to talk about the differences that that, that makes? Well, um, uh, Mr. Patel's uh, hotel is similar to uh, other um, hotels that currently have liquor licenses. We have about 20 in Lincoln where the entity that owns the hotel also has a liquor license that covers um, the entire property. Um, in, in this instance, like um, many of the others, they, there's an actual restaurant um, in, in the hotel. Um, there's three others in Lincoln that um, where the, the restaurant and or bar um, rent space, so they just have a liquor license that covers a small portion of that restaurant or that bar, um, but it doesn't cover the entire hotel. And for this um, situation, um, there's not the same types of concerns with the number of calls for service or the police services um, that um, you know were being used or utilized at the at the other place. And the rationale for for kind of this. Approving these sorts of applications would be uh, the the hotel owner already has control over the whole premises anyway, so it, it would make right more yeah sense. and and I um, you know whether it's a an embassy suites or um, you know Marriott or any number of uh, um, hotels um, around the airport, this is very similar to what they're doing. They're okay. just. Um, some of them have just a, what they call a manager's reception mm -hmm. um, where they provide free alcohol. But this is actually an environment where uh, tables and chairs and restaurant environment where they can come in. But then they would also have the option of taking a drink back to their room. Okay. So. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other questions for uh, Investigator Schaefer? Thank you, sir. Would you like to add anything, Mr. Patel? Just... Uh, you know, I care about the place, so I think uh, you can be rest assured that, you know, we'll try to control it. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Please call the next item. All right. Next then is item 16, application of Myers Wine for a special designated license to cover an indoor area measuring approximately 89 feet by 51 feet and an outdoor area measuring approximately 250 feet by 185 feet at Sheldon Art Gallery at 12th and R Street on June 24th between 5 p.m. and midnight. Hello. No, I need to be sworn. Oh, okay. Uh, Kevin Meyer, <laughs> Meyer's Cork and Bottle. Um, this SDL is identical to one that we just uh, did on June 3rd. Uh, it again is another uh, wedding reception where they would like to utilize the sculpture garden area outside of Sheldon. They've rented the space from Sheldon. Uh, they have adequate security in place to ensure uh, that any alcoholic beverages are, are contained. Uh, all the entry and exit points are contained. Um, it's a it, you know, it's, it's not a, a, a giant event. I believe they're only expecting in the neighborhood of about 150 people. So it will be adequately staffed and um, uh, monitored by us. Excellent. Questions from Mr. Meyer? 
Well, Carl. So how'd the one go last uh, from Saturday night? <laughs> Without a hitch. <laughs> Good. Okay. Other questions? That was my question. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. And would anyone else like to testify on this item? Mr. Chair, seeing none, I'd move approval of items four, uh, 14, 15, and 16. Second. Moved by John, seconded by Jane. Discussion? Please call the roll. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Next then are our public hearing resolutions. Item 17, accepting the report of new and pending claims against the city and approving disposition of claims set forth for the period of May 1st through the 15th, 2017. Report on this? Nope. nope. Okay. Would anyone like to testify on this item? <coughs> Very well. Next item. All right. Next is item 18, approving an amended cooperative agreement between the NDEQ and the city regarding an increase in State of Nebraska grant funding from the Stormwater Management Plan. Good afternoon, Council members. My name is Ben Higgins. I'm with Public Works Department. Uh, we typically get about $300,000 a year from an NDEQ grant. And, but the governor cut a lot of that budget, you know, because they had, a, they had a pretty big shortfall. And so what happened is we went and talked to the legislator with the appropriation committee and they put some of that money back in. And so this is in a month, this is funding here. This is additional funding they brought forward to us as part of that, that grant package that they put back in the budget. So we're receiving an additional $146,497 for a total of $311,225. Uh, this goes to pay for a lot of our roads and sediment control staff and our educator, and those are both items that education and roads and sediment control that we are required to do as part of our federal stormwater permit. So, if any questions? Questions? It's Larry. Could you just clarify those numbers, Ben? You okay, mentioned sorry. that this was an increase in funding, right. but it sounds like it's both a replacement plus a slight increase. Is that, am I understanding you correctly? Right. So, original. I mean, we usually usually they set about two million dollars aside for all the uh, stormwater permittees throughout the state, and so they cut that to eight hundred thousand. You know, at the, you know, so we were only allocated eight hundred thousand for all the cities that have that, and so when we originally got the funding, we only got uh, one hundred sixty-four thousand dollars. And so when we found out about that, we went and talked to the Appropriation Committee, you know, when they had all those hearings about, you know, about the funding cuts. And so we met with them, and <clears throat> through all those meetings with the, well, just the one meeting with them, the Appropriation Committee put that money back in there, and then that was approved by the governor to put that money back in there. So they added another eight hundred or $900,000 back into that fund. And then the amount we got back, then it was split out between all the cities, and the amount we got back was that $146,000. And so, if you typically get three hundred thousand, did you end up with a net increase? Actually, no, not well. Actually, we usually get three hundred thousand plus, so it's usually around three hundred fifty thousand. So we actually got a small decrease, but I mean, it's something we could live with. I mean, something we can we could work with, and we're okay with. It might be worth changing the language in the resolution that it says to allow for an increase in state grant funding if it's not actually an increase. I mean, you. Know, Okay. I was came here prepared to ask you how are you going to spend this increased oh, funding no. on what projects, but it sounds like well, that's not it is at all an increase because we originally only were, we are only given one hundred sixty four thousand, so it's an increase from that one hundred sixty four thousand. Okay, but it's a decrease from previous yeah, decrease. years. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, all right. Earl then Cindy. Yes, sir. Um, ben, the what what year is this for? Twenty sixteen. <laughs> it's it's a state. Don't ask me. Okay. So this is money that's already been spent. Is that? No, we haven't spent that. What we've already we've gotten in cash. We've gotten to cash one hundred sixty four thousand dollars. So we have that, you know, in our revenue. We have that as part of our revenue. So this is additional funding coming in, above and beyond the one hundred sixty four thousand. I'm just saying, in previous years, we've got three hundred thousand dollars plus, and we usually always get that in January every year. So this year we only got 164,000 because the governor cut some of that budget out and he put some of the money back in, you know, via the appropriations committee and then he approved that. Okay. And so we're we're kind of back up to where we normally have been in the past. Thank you. Okay. Cindy. So since we normally get about that 300,000 plus um, how how much was excuse me, how much was included in the budget? 
as a revenue, do I'm sure we must have anticipated that same three hundred thousand. Is that correct? Uh, yes, we do. And so what we do is we have staff that are just grant funded. Okay. And so we were kind of scrambling around, hope you know, making trying to make sure that we got this extra funding in source, and that's why we went to the appropriations committee. Okay. So, so this isn't any more than what you had budgeted for no. in the eighteen. Okay. No. Thank you. Okay. Hey, other questions for Mr. Higgins? Thank you, sir. Oh, sorry, I had Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, could you just briefly say how this will help link out what this money will be used for in terms of the stormwater management? Uh, so what we do for this is we have, again, we have some staff that are grant funded. So we have uh, about three and a half FTEs that do erosion sediment control. So this pays for two of those, two of those staff. We have one person that's a full FTE that does stormwater education. She goes out to like Waterfest. She helps with Waterfest. Uh, like LAS is having like a sustainability something coming up in a uh, late in June so she'll be forward for that she'll be you know in on that and then you know every year if you go out to the uh, like that uh, the building shows like we're out there at that building show if you've ever seen us out there and we hand out stuff to the kids and do education for the kids and oh and for example like the fireworks you know on the 5th of July right after that we do the we're the one that sponsors that cleanup there for the 4th of July cleanup for the 4th of July, uh, July jam so it's just various educational kind of items. I mean, we do them throughout the year. Uh, we also do a landscape uh, water quality grant that we do with homeowners. We have about 30 a year, and so she runs that program too. So just a lot of different various things for water quality education and, and erosion sediment control. All right. Thank you. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Very good. Next item, please. All right. Next is item 19, Comp Plan Amendment 17001. Application of the Public Works and Utilities Director to amend the 2040 comp plan to add the Upper Wagon Train Watershed Master Plan to the list of sub-area plans in the plan realization chapter of the comp plan and to amend the Lincoln Area and Lancaster County future land use maps to have the future land use designations be consistent with the proposed flood-prone area. We have somebody to present this? I yep. assume it's you. That's me. Yeah. Yep. Okay. This is our 11th uh, drainage master plan. And so, you know, when you do like water and wastewater master plans, they do the entire city all at once. Well, our master plans, they're very expensive because we loot, sometimes do a lot of hydrology and hydraulics with them. And sometimes we change the floodplain maps. And so what we do is we, we kind of do one basin at a time. And so this one here is the, uh, is the upper wagon train watershed master plan. And so this is our 11th, like I said, our 11th master plan. We're currently working on three more. And once we finish these other three, we'll have covered the entire city and also within its jurisdictional boundaries. So, and that's been a long time coming because we've been working on this for several years. Uh, so this master plan was actually part of that upper wagon train coalition that they're doing over there to get some more housing over there. And they're outside of the, uh, the regular basins that we have, but they're gonna bring that, they're gonna bring a sanitary sewer over there to bring that up there. And so as part of that agreement, that was done for that in 2006, we said, well, you guys need to do a watershed master plan for that area and said, we're not ready to do it yet. You know, we're just not out that far. And so the developer agreed to do the watershed master plan. And so they had, they actually had CDG do the watershed master plan and the Rokeby coalition coalition actually paid for it. And so we've reviewed it. We're okay with it. The NRD is okay with it. It provides long-term planning, just like all of our other master plans. It helps with floodplain management, uh, detention. It provides areas for detention, minimum stream quarters, uh, proposed hydraulic structures, uh, stormwater quality. So it covers all the other things all of our other stormwater master plans does. Uh, and also, as you can see in there, it revises the future land use for a couple areas. So where you have like flood-prone areas there, so it revises those into you know into a more appropriate uh, future land use. Uh, the one thing that it doesn't have that I meant to have on that, but I didn't, I neglected to uh, tell city law about it. It doesn't really have, it doesn't officially adopt the proposed flood prone areas there. So I will be bringing that back later to bring, to adopt those flood prone areas as official, flood prone areas as official best available information. And we do have information in the codes that allows us to do that. And so this, you know, what we're asking you to do is to adopt this, uh, this master plan. Questions for Mr. Higgins? Yeah. Lots of questions. Farrell. Thank you. Um, so I was was curious, Ben, because yeah. the map that we have yeah. on page 17 shows uh, the drainage right. essentially from about Cheney down yeah. south toward heading toward Hickman. So yeah. so what happens after that? Where, where does this water eventually end up? So this, 
water actually eventually it's, ends up in Salt Creek, so it drains from north to south. And, you know, we're in Lincoln and everything here drains south to north for them, like Salt Creek drains south to north. And so this drains north to south, but sooner or later it bends around, kind of makes a U-turn and head, heads back into Salt Creek, and then that ends up draining north. So the controlling the water... The earlier you control the water, the more it helps everything downstream. Right, and what we're really trying to do here is you want to have a master plan through here. You just don't want people to build just all over in the, because it's really not a good designated floodplain in this area there, so you don't want people building into places where it's, they're going to flood in the future. You know, we just don't want to be back to where we have been in the past, where all these houses are in the floodplain. Yeah. You know, and then it, they cost a lot more later on to fix all these areas where you have air, houses in the floodplain than it does to say, hey, this is a floodplain here. This is a good area to stay out of. So. Yeah. I just think this is actually kind of really curious and, and phenomenal that, yeah. that here's this, you know, this creek kind of yeah. going south of the city toward Hickman, but it ends up impacting North city, Lincoln yeah. and, yeah. and <laughs> West Lincoln. So it's, yeah. It's yeah. Very well, Salt Creek, you know, up into, uh, you know, up in the north part of town has almost 400 square miles of drainage. And you think about the city itself, you know, with about 100 square miles plus or minus, and then yet you got this big watershed that's 400 square miles. Mm. So it's a big watershed. Thanks. Okay. Other questions? Marion? So once, if this is adopted, how does it affect your operations going forward? How does the progressive adoption of plans change what you do day to day? Uh, what it does, it, it kind of gives a planning guide for that. So it allows, in fact, it's a pretty good deal for the Rokeby Coalition, too, because it allows them to say, well, these are the areas we're going to set aside for detention. So all these, when these developers come forward with these plans, they'll already know where they're going to have detention. It also lists out where the minimum stream quarters are. So, you know, they'll say, okay, well, this is a stream quarter we don't want to be messing with because it's a, you know, part of the codes that we need to set these areas aside. So you're always a lot better off having extreme quarters that are natural and leave in place, you know, because the way we used to do it back, you know, way back when was we put everything in the culvert. You know, in fact, if you think about N Street, N Street is really used to be a big long stream down through that area there, and now it's all in a big, like, 10 by 10 box, like a 10 by 10 box, an 8 by 10 box. And so you think all that infrastructure that was built in the 20s and 30s and 40s and all that needs to be maintained over the long run. So, you know, even though when you build it and it's all concrete and it's all good, you know, over the years, it just kind of deteriorates where if you have natural streams, you're just better off for stormwater quality and everything else, too. So, and, and you're saved money in the long run, too. So we're just trying to keep the stream quarters where they are. And so this allows us to kind of know where all those stream quarters are and which ones we need to leave in place naturally. Right. Trying to picture a box under N Street. Is that what you're saying? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's two of them. Really? You can walk in it. Really? Mm -hmm. yeah, if you go on the, yeah, if you go online uh, to Watershed, there's a video clip of, a, of, a, of it there on uh, one of the bond issues there. Okay. So you can even see me on the video. So. <laughs> I'll check it out. Right. Thank you. Whatever that's worth. <laughs> Maybe you don't want to see it then. So. <laughs> uh, Jane? Yeah. So, Ben, has the Watershed... Uh, stormwater master plan been done for the area south of Saltillo that's going to impact um, the South Beltway? Uh, yeah, Southeast Upper Salt Creek, a lot of that goes through Southeast Upper Southeast Salt Creek. Upper yeah, I've got Salt a map Creek. here. Okay. It's not a real good map. I don't know if that'll, <coughs> if that'll show up or not. I probably have it sideways. I hope I have it sideways. 180 degrees. So uh, this is really not a map. This this is actually a map of our three new watersheds on there, and you can see upper. And so this one hasn't been brought forward yet. So all the green ones are the new ones that we're developing right now, and you can see wagon train is down there and already shows it being done. But this is a future. This mm -hmm. is supposed to be for a future map. And you, so you can see the um, kind of that southeast upper Salt Creek one right there. <laughs> That's about in the area where the uh, that's about in the area where the beltway is there. So that's all been studied through that area there, southeast Upper Salt Creek, kind of off of Yankee Hill. So last time it was done was in two thousand and three. That's what it says on page four. Uh, that was southeast Upper Salt Creek. Yep. Yeah, it probably would have been. Yeah. So what we plan to do after we get all these next three done with the very with the next bond issue, we're going to kind of do a. Uh, a unified master plan of the entire area. So we'll take a relook at all of these drainage master plans and come up with a unified master plan for the entire area instead of having all a bunch of separate ones. So, okay. Other questions? 
Thank you very much. Hey, thank Would anyone you. else like to testify on this item? Good afternoon. My name is Mike Eckert with Civil Design Group. Uh, as Ben mentioned, we were the are the coalition engineer for that um, roughly 700 acres out there of uh, coalition members that uh, joined together back in 2006. And um, he was very accurate in mentioning that at that time. Uh, we, our firm figured out how to get a sewer line out to that area to open it up that was previously unplanned, primarily for what you were saying, Councilman Eskridge, it's a strange area. It all drains to the south, but we're gonna get all the sewer to go to the north. And so in doing that, the city said that's fine, but we really didn't have this in our budget or on our radar at all, this area. So would the coalition be willing to fund the watershed master plan? And so we did. And, uh, and, and there was some extra things that Ben needed, he's agreed to pay for. So it's been a really good thing for lots of reasons. I wanted to show that map that is in, I think in your packet too, to, just detail a couple things uh, uh, in terms of uh, the questions that were also asked earlier. So basically, this is the ridge line for the area that drains all the way to the south and ends up in Wagon Train Lake, and then obviously it's slowly released there. Yes, goes through Hickman, joins Salt Creek, wraps back around, comes through Lincoln, heads to Ashland. Um, and so the red area is generally that area that's developable because you have Jensen Park up here at 84th and Yankee Hill. Um, and then, uh, so we've established all the, what'll be the green space, the, the, the flood prone areas, as Ben said, will be coming through later. But probably the most unique thing about this was, um, it's the first watershed master plan, to my knowledge, in the city of Lincoln, where you had literally, we had 13 owners covering 700 acres that were able to be on the same page. And as such, we were able to get regional detention cells done. And um, that's really proved to be a, a financial windfall for them and will hopefully be easier for the city to manage over time. So uh, the, the, the two cells um, basically serve the entire area. So uh, as each project comes in, they won't need to have their own detention cells. They'll be accounted for. We have a model that will work, so when people come in and be developed and develop, that we have to adhere to all the standards that are in place today, including the normal detention and now the water quality, um, bed and bank areas, and other things like that. So, again, it's the study ended up going clear down to Sotillo, and then, as Ben mentioned, it was picked up by their other work. But uh, this was our stopping point, even though generally some of this area may not be developable because of the gravity sewer policy. So, um, I was just here to to uh, uh, thank the city for their work and cooperation. And, and Justin Cermax here today, he was with Flatwater Group, our main subconsultant on this. It did all the heavy lifting. So um, we, are, we are finalizing things on a private stormwater agreement with the coalition members on you know, paying for those cells and building them and when they need to be built. And so shortly, shortly um, we'll have an annexation, amendment to the annexation agreement that spells out a lot of those details too. But uh, it was, high time for this study to finally come through as we are just now getting out into some of these areas. And Ben and I had always agreed that we could, we could delay this for a while, but when it came, you know, when we started developing out there, we needed to get this approved. So that's kind of where we're at today. So um, again, I think it's been a good cooperative venture between the private development area and the city. So we're happy to have it before you today. Great. Questions for Mr. Eckert. Thank you, sir. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Next item, please. All right, next, our public hearing ordinances second reading, item 20, Street and Alley Vacation 17003, vacating a portion of the South 16th Street right-of-way directly north of Pine Lake Road. Good afternoon, David Carey with the Lincoln Lancaster County Planning Department. Here on this item to just uh, give a brief overview of what this is. This is a, uh, a public right-of-way street stub uh, on South 16th Street that is uh, actually part of the Costco development. Uh, part of that approval was to uh, move forward with the vacation of this stub. Um, this has gone through to the Planning Commission. It was on the consent agenda and was received uh, action that this uh, vacation was in conformance with the comprehensive plan. Uh, since that action was taken, the, uh, the payment was identified of $1,500, uh, the, the value of the property that has been uh, paid for now uh, as is required before it comes to city council and that is why it is now in front of you today. 
this is an item that basically makes sense for the overall plan for the Costco site. Um, we have discussed this that it needed to, to happen um, as part of the approval, and it is before you today for that purpose. So I can answer any questions that you might have. Questions for Mr. Carey? <coughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Next item, please. All right, next is item 21, Comp Plan Conformance 17007, declaring approximately 24,686 square feet of property, generally located at 7701 Gray Cliff Drive as surplus. It's you again. It is. <laughs> Members of the City Council, David Landis, Urban Development Department Director, the applicant in this case. We've been to the Planning Commission and we've been to other agencies to see if, first, there were any other public claimants for the use of this land, there were none, and secondly, if surplusing this property and selling it would be consistent with the comprehensive plan and the planning commission said it was. It's 24,000 square feet, but a good deal of it is covered by um, some LES uh, um, easements due to some high transmission lines, however, there is a lot available here for sale and uh, also some out lots. We'd sell all of the land, um, but not all of it is usable for um, the construction of residential property. Um, so we could anticipate, I think, a, a generously lawned house at this location in the event you gave us permission to sell the land. And that's the question before you today. Questions for Mr. Landis. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Would anyone else, else like to testify on this item? Okay, next item, oh, please. Oh, sorry, um, right. I have some questions for staff in the back. I'd okay. like to talk to the LFR folks who are here. Good afternoon, Council. Pat Bohr, Lincoln Fire and Rescue. Thanks for coming down. Um, I just wanted to ask about this particular um, item because I noticed in the staff report that this had initially been set aside as, as land for a potential fire station. You know, we've gone through a lot of public process since that time, and we have new sites that are being purchased and selected. But could you share with us a little bit about, um, you know, why this site was then maybe decided or determined not to be um, preferable and uh, were there problems? Is it different in terms of the response times? And uh, will the money, I guess this is another question about the money, and will the money from the sale of this property actually be put towards your department's efforts to build out the new fire stations? Uh, yes, I can answer those questions. <clears throat> um, it, to, answer, to be sure, the property is no longer um, a good viable location for a fire station. So that's the short answer. The long answer is it isn't because of a number of reasons. Response time is one of them. Um, where it's located in proximity to other stations is another one. Um, that particular piece of land was deeded to us from LES, so it's not um, it's not a piece of it's not a parcel of land that we went out and pursued like the ones we're currently pursuing. And so um, when we did obtain that quite a while ago, the uh, there wasn't the science behind location that there is today. And so um, there are a number of reasons why it just doesn't make it a good fit for Lincoln Fire and Rescue. Um, whether or not the sale, the proceeds of the parcel will go, will allow us to purchase others, we're hoping that you'll do that for us. I don't know the exact process for the proceeds of, of land, but we're certainly hoping that we can use those funds to purchase land for future fire stations in the places where we do need them. It doesn't seem like it's actually that far from the site at <coughs> Pine Lake that was ultimately selected. I mean, when you say that the this site wasn't ideal um, in terms of response times, are we talking about a lot more houses being covered if you go with the, the location at, at Pine Lake in 66 as opposed to this one? Yep, and, and if you look at um, if you look at the map and the plan growth, and we're right now looking at <clears throat> a, a parcel, trying to identify a parcel in the area of um, 40th and um, Yankee Hill and so that's actually very close to this one actually I think if you, as the crow flies is probably a mile due west but if you look at a mile and you talk about response time you're talking about two minutes and and then so that's significant as, as you know and then 
Um, the way that parcel sits in the development, we're looking when you look at when we're looking at parcels today, we're trying to uh, locate them on arterials where you have ac quick access, so you can go many directions, any direction that you need to go. That, as you look at that parcel and as you looked at the map that was presented, there is an access to 27th Street or 56th, or excuse me, 56th Street, and it's it's in the middle between it's in the middle of the square mile between, um, I think Yankee Hill and Pine Lake Road, I think. But so so a number of a number of things make it make it a not the right parcel. Okay. Other questions? I have a question for Dave Landis. That's, yeah. <clears throat> Dave, I assume this, tell me if I'm wrong, that the proceeds from the sale of this land will go into the land acquisition fund. And that that could then be spent how? Um, the land acquisition fund, I think, is an, uh, a, a charter-based obligation, as I recall. Money is spent to acquire land. When we sell land, it goes back into the advanced land acquisition fund for the purchase of land. It doesn't become general fund dollars or operations dollars. Informally, I believe the finance department, and here I'm passing along secondhand information, they do keep a record of which department was responsible for the land that was sold, and they keep an accounting in a sense of where they are. It is not an obligation, however, to keep those separate from a city spending purpose. And in the event somebody wanted to spend the urban development pot and the fire pot and the public works pot for X, so long as they did the sale in an appropriate way and with the council approval, it would come from there. The answer is land acquisition, going to buy land. It would be identified, I think it's fire department land, but that does not bind the city to only spend it for that purpose if they chose not to. So the quick answer is we could spend that money to buy land for a fire station. Yes. That's an even, that's the Reader's Digest congest <laughs> And probably the one you wanted when you asked the question, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. I should have seen that coming. Mm. Yeah. Do you have an estimate on the value of this property, given the constraints that you mentioned? With it would be hard to say. We don't start by setting a price and see if somebody will pay for it, because one of the reasons we, when we sell land, we also ask what use they're going to make of it. But if you were to say residential property, you might be thinking in terms of 3 or $4 a square foot. If it was commercial, it might be 10 This will wind up being residential. Okay. Other questions? Thank you very much. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Next item, please. All right, next are public hearing ordinances third reading, item 22, text amendment 17004, amending chapter 27.59 of the Link Municipal Code relating to airport zoning regulations by amending various sections. Hey, greetings. Good afternoon, members of the City Council. Danae Kalkowski, 1128 Lincoln Mall, Suite 105. Um, appearing today kind of on behalf of a group, um, a group of um, interested individuals got together working with the Home Builders Association of Lincoln, um, included myself, Mike Eckert, a um, couple home builders. Um, we all got together really to work with the um, city and the airport authority on some uh, amendments to the zoning text. Personally, I'm also representing two specific developers, um, the uh, Nebco uh, developers of the Fallbrook area and also the Ringneck uh, developers who have the uh, Northwest 48th and I-80. Both of these those areas within um, the uh, area that gets regulated by uh, these zoning regulations. Uh, this group really came together with the common goal of working with the city and the airport authority to amend the zoning regulations to streamline um, the height permit process and also try to eliminate some unnecessary costs and steps uh, for construction of residential homes, particularly single family and two family residential homes. And obviously the ultimate goal of our little group, it, it was to keep um, housing affordable in all sectors uh, of our city and obviously this area up kind of toward the north and northwest part of our city is is growing and so we're bumping into these airport regulations you know more often um, right now if under the current zoning ordinance if, if somebody came in and they were within this area 
Uh, they might have to get their own individual height permit, which right now the application fee is $412. And then once they've constructed their home, they'd have to go in individually and get a survey done to prove what the ultimate height of the building was, and that's another probably four to $500. So easily adding at least $1,000 to the cost of every home. So we really wanna thank the city staff and the airport authority for their willingness to meet and work on an amendment. Um, I can't say we either side got everything they want, which is probably you know the good sign of a compromise. Um, and we didn't have it all worked out by, at planning commission. Um, they gave us a little nudge and asked us to work a little harder. And so we went back and were able to, um, I think, come to at least some consensus on um, the language that's before you today. Uh, but the, basically, the proposed amendments to the ordinance really, we believe, will have a significant impact um, on costs. Um, they're going to allow developers, uh, the city and the airport authority, to determine early on in the development process during our early planning stages if we have some areas within a residential development that while they might be located in the shaded area, um, they are still at a low enough elevation that we don't have to do this individual permit and, and individual certification. Um, so on these areas, we'll be able to obtain one blanket height permit, and then if our elevation is at a certain area, we will not have to do the post-construction certification. Um, there are some you know, limits on that. It works for a single family and two family dwellings. We have to be in a zoning district or a PUD where the maximum height would be 35 feet, which is a typical you know, residential um, height restriction. Um, but I think this really will result in some uh, significant cost savings and it, and it really takes the burden off of the home builder, home buyer and you know, pushes some of that due diligence to earlier on in the process. Um, I think that the, while we're all in agreement on the language that's before you, I think we want to, everybody wants to see how this works. Um, and I think, you know, if, it, if it's working well and we get some of the information as to um, how it's been working, you know, we may even be back visiting with you in the future to see if there are more ways to maybe eliminate some of that post-construction certification requirements. Um, if we can show that we're just really not causing a problem in that area, that may allow us to save additional costs even in some other areas. But this really was a good start and really will be helpful when we're dealing with uh, residential developments um, in this area. Um, at this time, I guess I'm asking for your approval of the proposed amendments, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Ms. Kolakowski? Jane. So this only involves residential? Yes. Okay. Thank yes. you. Carl. Can you explain what area this applies to? So we're kind of looking at, I think, the yellow area on the map there. So it, it includes a big, you know, a big area. Um, what, what you're going to do is they're going to take and look at, you know, take off from the end of each of the end of the runways and you, you go diagonal and you're really looking at the elevation of the ground out here. So while the yellow area may be area that everybody's looking at, not necessarily with the elevation in that area um, cause a problem. So let me look show you one other thing, Carl. The areas I think of primary interest within that yellow are the, are the areas that are shaded gray. Those are our shaded areas. And you can kind of see that they follow ridge, you know, ridge lines. So they sort of match the elevations. When you're getting into those gray areas, you're getting into this you know, height above the end of the runway where there's potential to cause obstructions with the airport operations depending upon the height of the buildings that you're building out there. Those gray areas are always tricky, aren't they? They are <laughs> tricky. <laughs> okay. All right. And they always seem to pop up, don't they? Okay. Thank any, you. Any other questions? Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Thank you, ma'am. Mike Eckert with Civil Design Group. Um, as Danae mentioned, uh, I was uh, involved in this process on behalf of the uh, Strostica Lewis development, which is Highland View 
which is, uh, most of you are familiar with Fallbrook, so Highland, there's the old Highland View on the south, or Highlands on the south side of Highway 34. Highland View is on the north side, and it gets up into some pretty high altitudes. And, and so uh, we were very involved in the process, and, and I concur with everything that Danae said, and I, I wanted to put this exhibit up. I think it was in your materials, but um, Councilman Christian, in, in, as, our, as we endeavor to have the Reader's, readers Digest versions of what's going on here today, um, in, in the past, if we were at this 75-foot uh, line above the elevation, we still had 75 foot left before we got into a zone that concerned the airport. But yet, once we were there, we had to go through this process of getting a pre building permit survey and a post building permit construction certifying that this house was not more than 75 feet high. Well, this just was fairly logical given that most residential zoning districts have a height limitation of 35 feet. So this is one of the most valuable things we got out of this is we have <coughs> moved that line up uh, a little bit higher uh, and, and we're still, even with where we've set it, a, a typical 36 to 38 foot high home will still be 12 to 15 foot above, below that buffer zone. And between the survey work required and the extra fees at building and safety, it's near $1,000 a house. So on Highland View alone, we'll have hundreds of houses that will not have to get this permit. We'll still have hundreds that will, that were in that gray area, but uh, in terms of uh, saving, and that was falling on the home builder, and as Danae said, so we're trying to shift some of this back into the developer that he has to take care of some of these, do the blanket permits earlier. And the other issue that's not on this chart, but was regarding an FAA notice that's required for piercing, when your homes might pierce a certain uh, plane, a plane at, in, in terms of that coming off of not, a P-L-A-N-E uh, coming, coming off of, or no, P-L-A-I-N. <laughs> Go back to second grade here, <laughs> P-L-A-I-N. A plane coming off the end of the runway at a, I think it was a one to 200 slope, that we, there's a different requirement out there from the FAA on the federal level that says you need to give us notice. And so we, at Highland View, we're going to do that um, because we have to. But midway through this process, there's still going to be a regulation that we had to do that basically in each phase of the development to get building permits. And we got that changed so that the airport authority will now have the opportunity to require that on new prelim plats or community unit plans coming through. But in terms of Highland View and Fallbrook and Ringneck, since those have all been approved, we will do the FAA notice on our own goodwill, but it won't be anything that's holding up building permits. So that was another important compromise. So, um, so we're very happy with it, and I believe the airport authority is. And so, um, uh, second project today, I can stand up here and said we had some good private sector and public cooperation to get this thing done. Very good. John. Thank you, Mr. Eckert. You mentioned that this would allow hundreds of homes to not have to do these uh, surveys and so forth, but you said there are hundreds that still will. Now, when Ms. Kalkowski testified, I maybe I misunderstood, but I was thinking it was more the commercial areas that would still do it, but not the residential. So could you clarify that, please? So there were, what doesn't show up on this uh, chart, and I'll try to get Zoom back in. Um, I think we're talking about the gray areas. Right. So uh, in, in essence, and there's Highland View in that box, but there was a lot more gray area on the Highland View development, the Fallbrook development, and the Ringneck developments before. There's still some left. So, uh, you know, this area in green that's not in the gray area now, we wouldn't need to get the height permits, but the area in gray, we still would need to be. But the gray area has been significantly reduced with this process, Is that, if that makes sense. Well, you said there would still be hundreds in the... Yeah, the so I I the scale of this might be deceiving, but generally in that box, there's probably, I think Highland View is permitted for 460 homes. Mm. So if you can imagine, uh, Councilman, the... The green area down here may have a couple hundred homes, and then we still may have 100 to 150 up in the gray area that would need to get this height permit. So, With the work that you've done with your group, is there any way within constraints of the FAA to 
perhaps help those other residences to again create more affordable lots or less expensive lots what we are going to have to do what we can do what part of the burden that's been shifted to the developer is is we'll get a for the gray areas we can get the upfront permit we can get the blanket permit so they won't have to worry about that component of it but they are high enough and in that close enough to the, that upper level that is deemed to be a threat that they still will be required to have the post-construction survey where our surveyors go out and shoot the top of the residential roof and then a professional licensed surveyor is certifying that it is um, you know whatever the elevation is building and safety can compare that and say yep you're below that threshold and that they can then um, get their occupancy permit we talked a little bit about trying to continue to push that higher as you saw we still have generally about a 12 to 18 foot gap um, but we thought it would be best I think in the spirit of compromise to leave that as it is for now maybe we reevaluate it in the future um, because another 10 to 12 feet would take several more lots out um, so uh, I, I We talked also about the building and safety fee to review that, and and maybe that's something we can work with them over time on. Uh, but it does take them extra time to process that at the end, and so um, that'd be the only other area that I think we could work on is what that fee is over time that building and safety charges. Well, you know, a lot of residences uh, are concerned about the air traffic noise and so yeah. forth. And if you've got a developer with some areas here. Is it possible that the developer, if they're doing uh, spec homes, that they might do a dozen or more, that they can do that process at one time for all 12, is in my example, and that way you just have if one fee that's shared? In the gray area, the only way they could do that at one time is if they were all uh, generally uh, framed up and, and, and close to being finished at the same time, and the survey crew could just hit X number of houses in a row and certify that, and that would very, make it very economical on the survey fee. I don't know; it doesn't change the building and safety fee because it is per house. Okay. So, um, but it is substantially better, um, and I think we've got the developers aware that when they are selling these lots, they will make the builder aware of it before they sell the lot. And I think that was kind of one thing that's caught a lot of the builders off guard was. What do you mean I have to go in and get this hype permit and then you know and then when they're trying to get occupancy you can imagine the furious call we get on our survey line saying can you come out and certify the height of this building I have people moving in tomorrow you know I need to get closed on this so okay. I think they're there the builders are gonna be more aware of it the developers are more aware of it we've got a good compromise there's room for more work in the future and we've also satisfied how we can address the FAA issue um, in terms of, you know, none of us want to be in a situation where flight patterns coming in on these routes shown in green have to be altered, and it could affect funding for the airport. I mean, that was the airport authority's biggest concern. So, but I think um, they're satisfied and we're satisfied. So, Thank I'd you. like to push this All forward. Right. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you, sir. Anyone else like to testify on this item? Rick Bale from the City Law Department. Uh, if you'll note on your agenda, there's a request to delay action on this item till June 19th, another two week delay. Uh, we're doing that as there's a companion uh, item on your agenda, Bill number 1773, that's item 44 under first reading, uh, that uh, previously amended some of these same sections of the airport zoning regulations that we're amending by this bill. Um, when we were looking at that, we discovered that uh, that ordinance was adopted without meeting the uh, additional notice requirements under the state law for a 10-day notice. So in order to get that ordinance to catch up and then be able to be adopted just prior to this bill, uh, we need to defer action to the 19th. So. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Pay, was that the reason for this amendment to the first measure? I think that amendment there is just a publication amendment that we're just trying to save money to the city. So that's a that's a different uh, purpose for that amendment. All right. Anyone else on this item? Thank you. Next item, please. That concludes our public hearing. We can move into the voting session. 
public hearing resolutions. Item 17, the report of claims against the city for the period of May 1st through the 15th, introduced by Eskridge. Moved. Second. Moved by Carl, seconded by Jane. Discussion? Is, this, is there an amendment here? So, no, on the next one. on the next one. The next yeah. one. Okay. All right. Please call the roll. Ayla Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Item 18 is the amendment to the cooperative agreement with NDEQ introduced by Eskridge. So moved. Second. Moved by Carl, seconded by Lyrian. Discussion? Please call the roll. Just yeah. add, can I just add that um, I, this is obviously very important. This is ongoing effort to just make sure that we are providing uh, the ability for the city to grow and to grow in places where there's less risk of flooding to manage stormwater and provide some predictability for the people who are who are building out our community. So I intend to support this. Please call the roll. Kayla Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. <laughs> Item 19 is Comp Plan Amendment 17001. Upper Wagon Train Watershed Master Plan, introduced by Eskridge. So moved. Second. Moved by Carl, seconded by Jane. Discussion? Please call the roll. Kayla Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Public Hearing Ordinances Second Reading are items 20 and 21. Public hearing ordinances third reading is item 22, text amendment 17004, introduced by Camp. So moved. Second. Moved by John, seconded by Carl. And I Mr. Chair, we have a I would make to... a motion to delay until June 19th. Okay. Second. Moved. A motion to delay by John, seconded by Jane. And I believe that would be uh, action only. Correct. That's right. Okay. okay. Discussion on the uh, delay? Please call the roll. Gayla Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Ordinances third reading, item 23, is a license agreement between the city and Verizon for the placement of telecommunications facilities upon city property located at 3403 West Van Dorn Street. Introduced by Camp. So moved. Second. Moved by John. Second by Benny. Any discussion? Yes. Um, these cell towers are valuable to our community and to parks in particular. Uh, some of them are on parks property. Some of them are on our golf courses. <laughs> and and this, this one happens to be on the Pioneers Golf Course. 200, or excuse me, $24,000 a year. Uh, if it maxes out its 30-year possibility, that would be $720,000 over 30 years. Uh, that's a lot of green fees. That would be great. Any other discussion? Thank you. Please call the roll. Gayla Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried 7-0. to zero. By Item way, clarification, if I may, there's also a 3% annual escalator. Thank you. <laughs> Bonus. <laughs> Next item, please. All right, item 24, authorizing the issuance of tax allocation bonds for the Nebraska Innovation Campus Phase Two Redevelopment Project, introduced by CAMP. So moved. Second. Moved by John, seconded by Carl. Discussion? Please call the roll. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Resolutions first reading are items 25 through 42. Our ordinances oh. first reading are 43 through 48. On items 42 and 45 through 48, we've had a request to continue public hearing to June 19th. Move that we delay these items with public hearing to June 19th. Second. Moved by Larry and seconded by Benny. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Gaylor Beard? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. I believe we also have a motion to amend for item 39 that was distributed. Is that something we need to deal with today? No. 
We don't need 44. to act on that until okay. next week. Yeah, okay. I make a motion though on item 44. Um, let's see, Mr. Payo is, uh, no, I, uh, I'm sorry, that's what the other one's gonna coordinate yep. with it, pardon me. Okay. I make a motion we adjourn. <laughs> Second. <laughs> Second by John. <laughs> Please call the roll. Taylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Shope? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried, seven to zero. We are adjourned. <laughs>